All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome. We are going to go ahead and get started. It is 10 o'clock. I'm sure people will continue to uh, pop in. Um, okay. Let me make sure I have everything ready. I do. All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Uh, my name is Sochil Tirado. I am a faculty mentor with CDC, and I'm also a DE coordinator at Imperial Valley College. Um, Maria Elena Fernandez is also here. Um, she's going to be helping with the chat and just helping make sure that the session uh, goes smoothly and dropping things in the in the chat links in the chat and things like that. Marilena is also a faculty mentor with CVC, and I am almost positive, Marilena, that you are a D coordinator. You're also right. Okay, that's what I thought your your title was. I wasn't sure at College of the Syscues. Uh, thanks for being here, everyone, um, and we are going to go ahead and get started because there is a lot to cover today. Uh, so as you guys know, the session is being recorded and it's going to be available on our poker site by the end of this week. I'll post it up there. So if uh, you have any reviewers that were not able to attend, they can always take a look at the recording. Um, as a local poker certified campus, we strongly recommend that every reviewer attend at least two norming sessions a year. So thank you all for being here. Um, Marilena is going to be dropping in a sign-in sheet in the chat. Uh, so please add your name uh, next to your college's name. All right. All right. So here is our agenda for today. Um, this is our last roaming session of the academic year, so I am so happy that we made it through another year. Um, I'm sure some of you guys are either already have finals or are getting close to finals or maybe even close to summer sessions, things like that. Um, so anyhow, this is our last roaming session of the year. Um, we don't have dates for fall norming sessions, but we will have norming sessions in the fall. Uh, so poker leads look out for that email um, inviting you to the next norming session. Um, it'll it'll come uh, a, a month before the norming session happens. OK, so today we are going to cover Section D of the rubric, which is, as we all know, accessibility. There's been a lot of requests from you all uh, for us to cover Section D. So we finally are here talking about accessibility, everyone's favorite topic, I am sure. Um, uh, before we begin, I do have uh, a poll question, which let's see. OK, uh, let's do this one. All right, so I have a poll question for you guys uh, regarding accessibility, and I hope you can see it. Yes. Yeah, okay, good. So if you can, and I meant to put other and I forgot. So hopefully one of those three categories fits uh, your college. So I'll give it uh, another few seconds. Oh, when I see a misspelling, I am so sorry. I was just too excited when I created that poll. I see a few more people adding to the poll. Okay, I think we've got almost everyone. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and end it so that you guys can see the results. So there are the results. So who reviews accessibility for most? Uh, it's a tie, it looks like, between poker reviewers and uh, somebody else that is designated just to review accessibility in your campus. And then there's a small amount of you that have your poker lead review accessibility. So I just thought it would be interesting for us to see where we're all at before we continue. I do have one more question for you um, before, and you guys can't see the poll anymore, right? It's gone from your screen. Yes, or is it still there? Oh, it's it's gone, okay. Perfect. All right. So then I have one more. Um, and this this requires a little bit more uh, work because it's uh, a question that you need to type your answer in. Is everybody able to see the question? What accessibility tools does your poker team use? Can Am I sharing that? Yes, you are. Thank you so much. 
So uh, if you guys can go ahead and scan that QR code um, or if you go to menti.com and you can use that code, um, what accessibility tools does your poker team use? I hope this is gonna update itself. Oh, yay. <laughs> Thank you. And you can add more than one. The little man. <laughs> All right. So we've got a lot of different tools that we use. Hope Tech seems to be big. Uh, the Canvas Accessibility Checker, which is a little man, the little person in Canvas. Some of you guys have you do it. Uh, the Wave tool. And then there's some manual checking going on. All right. Thank you, everyone. Okay, so let's get back to um, our topic. Okay, so everybody across the state, we all have different tools. Our teams all look different. Um, and the workload for reviewing accessibility and making a course accessible is, it, it's a lot, it's a lot to do. Um, so even though this, even though it's true that our college has a unique team and we all use different resources for accessibility, we all have the same goal in mind. So we all want to make our courses accessible. And as reviewers, that is constantly what may be in your minds is how do we help faculty make their course accessible? How do we get through this workload? So what I'm going to present today, and I have a few others presenting as well, um, hopefully will help your team uh, with that accessibility uh, review. Um, so there's no way to put this, uh, no other way to put this, but reviewing accessibility is, it's a lot of work for us and um, it could be at times stressful to review accessibility and it could be, it can be stressful to think of all of the things that have to be accessible. Um, so we do have a lot of responsibility as reviewers and our responsibility really is to review all of these things. So we're looking at closed captions, images, all of the things that we have been trained to do, that is our, um, that is what we have to be checking for. Fortunately, we do have some resources. Um, as you guys all dropped in that um, word cloud, uh, we do have some resources that are available to us. So um, the all, all of us have these resources that I've listed here. Uh, you may or may not be familiar with them. So I'm just going to briefly go over them. And as I do, Marilena can drop some uh, links for you in the chat in case you're not aware that we have these. So Pope Tech is a big one. Um, we are all able to have Pope Tech installed into our Canvas instance. Um, if you don't have that in your college, um, there is a request form that you can submit. And Marilena will add that to the chat in just a bit. Um, so Pope Tech is really two tools. It's an in-Canvas accessibility uh, checker that will tell you what is wrong with every page, every assignment, anything that you build in Canvas. But there's also the Pope Tech dashboard, and that one is a little bit newer for all of us to have access to. The Pope Tech dashboard basically gives you a snapshot of the accessibility issues that a course may have. Um, so if you don't have that tool, I do recommend that you look into getting it for your college. We also have this document converter, which um, 
we all have access to it. I think this is just one level of this type of accessibility tool, but we do all have access to this document converter. Again, Marielena will drop that in the chat. Basically, what you do is you upload your file, you'll get an email, and the file will be sent to you in different versions that are accessible. Um, so again, in case you didn't know that, that was there it is. Um, and then we have um, some other tools like Equidocs is a web-based application uh, that assists in the remediation of inaccessible PDF documents. Um, we also have a lot of trainings through the CCC Accessibility Center. Um, and for poker, we still have that section D, and this is specifically for reviewers. So the first, uh, all of the tools that I've listed, those are available to reviewers and instructors as well. That last one, the poker section D, that one is for reviewers. And I will um, announce this again at the end of the session, but that section D, if you haven't taken it, uh, please complete it soon because on June 30th, you will uh, we will close it from um, from uh, it giving you a badge. So you won't be able to get a badge for Section D after June 30th. The course will still be available. It'll be a public view, uh, but to get a badge, you need to complete that by June 30th. And I'll repeat that again at the end. Um, so anyway, these are the resources that we have as uh, all, all colleges across the state. So these really will help us make those courses accessible. Um, but I do want to emphasize that even though we have responsibility as reviewers, it is so important that we put some responsibility on our faculty. Um, so this is why having a robust preparation process that includes accessibility is going to be so important to your team and helping with this accessibility review. Um, so um, it's important that your team creates some sort of pre-course review guidelines. So besides having um, PD for review as part of that um, faculty preparation, you also want to consider a few things for reviewing a course. So um, first of all, let me talk about faculty prep. So this is that um, professional development that, um, that your faculty can get. So one of the things that I think is really important is in the rubric D1 through D7, they basically covers these things listed in this slide. Those things, um, we, we should do our best to get our faculty prepared to make those pieces accessible. So if our faculty is really well trained in making D1 through D7 accessible within Canvas, that's going to make my, our jobs as reviewers so much easier. So offering professional development uh, in your campus, um, using the at one courses that are available to you and having your faculty complete those courses, that's going to help them be familiar with accessibility and being able to make certain pieces of their courses accessible. So that faculty preparation is so important. Um, another thing I want to talk about briefly is um, some pre-review pre pre guidelines that your teams can adopt. So before your team gets a course for review, there should be some things that uh, the instructor should do with the course. So one of them is have a master shell. Uh, so have the course in a master shell so that there's no students enrolled, so that just the reviewer and the instructor is in that course that's being reviewed. That way it doesn't disrupt any teaching that's happening live. Um, have your instructors run the link validator in Canvas. That's something that's really easy to do and it really does you know, flag some of the links that may be broken and they can fix them before the course even gets to you guys. Um, the Canvas Accessibility Checker, that little man, have the instructor go through every single Canvas page assignment, et cetera, and have them check for accessibility in Canvas. Then if you have Pope Tech, have them go through, go on the dashboard and find, you know, it, fix any of those critical errors. There should be no critical errors when you get the course for review. So make sure to have instructors do that. Um, Canvas files. Um, so with Canvas files, it's really important that the instructor clean up those files. 
And um, there's been, uh, there's different ways for, for instructors to have them organize those files and make it easier for you guys as reviewers to look through those files. So one suggestion that we have is to have files based on um, document type. So like have instructors create a, a folder for PDFs, have them create a folder for PowerPoints, have them create a folder for Word documents, and so on and so forth. So that's just going to make it easier for reviewers to find where the files are and they're already going to be organized. And if we have instructors do this, their files are going to, it's going to be nice and clean. Um, pages is the same thing in that master shell. Make sure that there's only pages that are going to be used in the course, because if there's unpublished pages that they're like, oh, but I don't use that in the course, the uh, Pope Tech dashboard is going to flag possibly those unpublished pages. So having a clean master shell is really helpful. So again, just some guidelines for you guys to consider. Okay, so what we're gonna do next is I do have an activity. So whether, if you guys have been uh, in my set, in these sessions before with me, you know that I always like to put an, put an activity uh, for us to kind of talk about or complete. So I am gonna put you in breakout rooms um, if you hate these, I do apologize, but I do get some good feedback on them. So I'm going to continue. Um, so this is going to be super short. You're going to have about 10 minutes in your breakout session to talk about this activity that is in this slide. Marilena is going to drop um, the activity in a, a Google Doc so that you can have it because once I put you in breakout rooms, you're not going to have access to this slide. So make sure to click on that link that Marilena is dropping so that you have the activity open. Uh, but essentially, this is the activity. Uh, the course that you are reviewing is aligned in just about every area of the rubric. The instructor includes a PowerPoint every week. The PowerPoint itself is not accessible. What suggestion would you give to the instructor? So down at the bottom, you can see an image, and that's what that page looks like in the course with the PowerPoint. Um, so um, there are some barriers. Your college does not have an accessibility specialist. So as a reviewer, you are the accessibility person and um, your college does not have an instructional designer either. So you have very limited resources. I think a lot of us can, um, can, can um, uh, are living that uh, right now. So I am gonna put you in breakout rooms. Again, it's gonna be a little bit less than 10 minutes, probably about eight because we have to come back. And when we come back, we'll talk about this and how we would solve this problem. So let me get the breakout rooms. There are how many of us? 85 of us. Okay, so let's do, um, I'm gonna do 12 breakout rooms. So it's gonna be a, bit, a big group. Um, but six to seven participants per room. I think that'll be good enough. All right, uh, open all rooms. All right, so about eight minutes. Welcome back everyone. We have five seconds left before they close out automatically. All right. All right, everyone should be back. Thank you so much. Hopefully it was a good conversation. Hopefully um, all of the groups had a, a chance to talk about this. And I just realized that I forgot to tell you who was gonna be the spokesperson for each group. So um, I am taking volunteers. Who would like to tell us what their group decided uh, uh, they would do about this uh, course. Anyone? Someone's got to start. I'll go for it. Thank you. Uh, I think we we had um, kind of a multi-step process with the first being asking the instructor, why is this here? Like, does it really need to be here? Um, and then kind of depending on that answer, going to next steps. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Who else wants to go? I'm another Suzanne. Oh, <laughs> so you. I'll go next. Um, you know, I'm in accessibility, so it was a little bit easier for me. Uh, but but the people in our group had some great suggestions. Uh, one person was copying, and pasting, and creating a transcript on Canvas pages. 
Um, and I suggested 3C Media to get a free transcript done. Um, a couple of people weren't familiar with that service. And, you know, I use it all the time when I can. And and uh, when the money's available, it's uh, all grant based and free for us. So uh, I told her she could just download that transcript and post it on her pages. But also another instructor was saying that he he creates um, narrated PowerPoints. And this is what I do as well, because I was, you know, had a million PowerPoints and they were really long with lots of images. <laughs> and so uh, I, I created narration with closed captions, got them corrected. And that was what I posted for my PowerPoints. And they're hor horrible to, to remediate. So I had to go to the publisher for a psychology course I was teaching and they, they, it was horrible. All their PowerPoints that were supposed to be accessible weren't. So I requested that they do it for me because it would have been, you know, for me, a professional would have taken at least three weeks and I don't have time for that. I, I have many things going on to serve our students. So um, yeah, so they did that and it, they weren't happy, <laughs> but they did it. I told them we wouldn't use it. Uh, yes, they did fix them, Suzanne, and it took them two weeks. And he was very upset. He was he only could do a little at a time, and yeah. And I told him it was crap the first time he did it. I know like, this is a big publisher. Publisher, I think it was. Uh, I want to say uh, Pearson, but no, McGraw Hill. Yeah, that's great. I'm glad that you stood up and that you you know, demanded that they, you know, do their job and make it those accessible. That's awesome. I'm going to go ahead and go to Ying that has her hand up. Hi, um, I was fortunate uh, enough to be in a breakout room with the great Cheryl Chapman. So I'm actually, I'm totally stealing Cheryl's thunder over here. Uh, but Cheryl gives the best advice uh, to use accessible template. So even if you get a uh, PowerPoint from publishers, if you copy and paste into an accessible template, that makes it so much easier to remediate uh, and make the PowerPoint uh, accessible. Uh, so that's our discussion. Nice. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that. That's great. That's a great tip. Um, there's just so many different ways that we can go about this. But the bottom line is that it has to be accessible. Would anybody else like to share like a different idea that was discussed in their group? We have time for one more. Um, I can share. Thank you. Um, so first of all, we, ha we have to look at the different options right there. Uh, you can remediate uh, um, a material. You can uh, uh, create a capt caption video or uh, create content pages. But the first thing, I, I uh, just the, the one thing that we, we talked about originally is we want to ask the, the the person whoever created the PowerPoints, what are you doing with them? And so some some PowerPoints can be remediated very quickly. For example, a lot they have a lot of text and things like that. But but asking them what are what are you doing with them? What's your intention with them and everything like that will also give you the ability to to get the uh, um, the explanation up front to, uh, to talk about what what the uh, so the students know what you're going to be doing with the, them as well. And uh, that might give you a little bit of background. So um, obviously, the, uh, ultimately, you you really want to have uh, change the culture within the the uh, college itself, uh, so that they start with content pages or they use a design plus or something like that. So that's that's what our conversation went, where our conversation went. And I and I I was very blessed to have a group of of uh, um, uh, people that really knew what they were doing. So it's not me. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, I think everyone in this room has something to contribute. And I think that it's really important for us to remember that we all have, you know, even though you're just like, oh, I have no idea what to do, but we know it's not accessible. Sorry about that. We know it's not accessible and um, we know that we have to remediate it. So, you know, everyone may have a different way to do that. Um, but that is, you know, really, it, it has to be made accessible. And um, I think that what uh, Lindsay shared is so important that talking to the instructor and asking them, and Suzanne mentioned this too, like, why do they have this PowerPoint? Like, why is it there? Is it that important? I, you know, really, is it that important? But then also like understanding what the goal is for the student, like what should the student be getting out of this PowerPoint? And that will help 
you know, as is us as reviewers, help them remediate that. Maybe we can have, you know, share a different idea. Well, you know what, instead of a PowerPoint, what if you do this, you know, maybe a video serves you, serves it well. Maybe having a transcript as mentioned, you know, is, is a better is a better solution. Um, and I think when we're reviewing courses, that conversation with the instructor is really important to really understand what they're trying to do with each of these pieces that they're putting in their course, uh, that they're adding to their course. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and stop and continue. Thank you everyone so much. I hope that you all had a good group of people to talk uh, to, talk to about this uh, situation, but this is just one small, uh, you know, example of many, many others that we get. And I feel like uh, every time we get stumped with an accessibility issue, it's all, it, it's typically something very unique. Um, so, you know, feel free to use the resources um, that I mentioned. You know, you can always email me if I don't know the, I don't know all the answers, but if I don't know it, I will find the answer for you. The, I, the great thing about this position that I have is that I have all of you at my fingertips that I can reach out to and ask, um, you know, for help. So I appreciate all of you. All right, we're going to go ahead and move on. And we have Suzanne from Butte College that is going to uh, present next on inherently inaccessible content. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing, Suzanne, so you can um, share. Can, can you enable screen sharing? Oh, or? I'm sorry about that. Let's see. Oh, I lost my actually. Let me, Suzanne, I'm going to make you a co-host. There you go. Perfect. Yeah. Okay, I'm getting myself organized. All right, so um, for for this section, we're going to cover kind of two topics. One is uh, the more complex parts of alt text, and then another is those documents that are just inherently inaccessible and some strategies to help instructors deal with those. Um, the we're going to start with some basics. Y'all probably know this, but it, it's important, I think, to start with the foundation. So one of the um, kind of key aspects to alt text is to keep it briefer than about 140 characters. I've actually seen a lot of different numbers for this, and I've talked to some accessibility folks, and this seems to be more of an issue for older screen readers, like the newer ones can manage more of these. But I think we we can't assume that students have the newest and you know the latest and greatest, and so it's important to have um, access for the older screen readers as well. And plus, it, it tends to get really cumbersome if you have this you know long paragraphs of alt text. If there's text in the image, that needs to be in the alt text. But I think more importantly is there really shouldn't be too much text in the images, right? So a lot of times instructors want to have um, these quotes with pretty scrolls around them as an image. And there's better ways to, to do that if you want to call out uh, con text than using a div box. And this is shown in the At One courses, how, how to set this up. But this is just a lot clearer as a way to set up quotes. The other image with text in, uh, sorry, the other issue with text in images is that it doesn't, it doesn't scale well for students that need to zoom into the screen. So you can even see the uh, the text in the bottom of this slide is a picture of text, and it's already getting kind of fuzzy, um, and I haven't zoomed in. So overall, it's, it's important to encourage instructors not to use images with a lot of text. Sometimes if they have like a graph and there's text around the graph, I encourage them to just remove the text and put it in a caption rather than have that be part of the picture itself. Another key one is not to have um, continual motion. And I'm just gonna leave this up for a second as, as a reason for why, because your eye keeps getting drawn to it. I don't know about you, but even trying to talk with this slide here, I keep refocusing and um, kind of zoning out to the image. So don't have continual alt text because it distracts students. And the, the solution to this is to add a play and pause button to the GIF. Right, like GIFs are lovely and, and I, I really enjoy things that show students how 
I teach biology, so molecular images and how molecules interact is a lot easier than trying to explain that in text. Um, and so there's great gifts, but you want to add a stop button so that a student can continue reading without being distracted by the image. So those are just some basics. Now we're going to delve into the more complex stuff. And to do that, we're going to play a game. So I'm going to put pictures on the, sl on the slide. And um, oh, Janet, are you asking how to add a st stop button for GIFs? Uh, so I don't actually know how to do that. <laughs> I ended up removing my gifts, but if someone has a, a link to how to, how to do that, I know it's possible. I just haven't done it. Thank you, Moses. There's resources online. Okay. Um, so I'm going to put images on the screen and you're going to type in the chat, yes or no, if it's decorative or not. So here we go. Decorative or not? Yeah, so um, it depends on the, the context, right? Um, so there, there's a lot of different answers on this one. And I think it depends on what the purpose is. So for, for this slide, I started with this one because this section is supposed to be one that makes you kind of think, right? So this is setting tone. And setting tone is important for, I think, a lot of a lot of our content, because if we're trying to make the content more um, accessible to students, more friendly, as it were, um, then you want to maybe say something like confused frog, right, or confused frog clip art. Setting the tone is is something that is worth considering if it's just here for no reason at all. I just liked frogs and this was cute, then. Another in, another question to ask the instructor is, is um, yeah, it's not easy being green. If it's truly just here for no reason, then why is it here, right? Like if we just have clutter on pages, that can also be distracting to students. And so avoiding clutter, right? Less is more, I think is one of the most common things I tell instructors is less is more. One good image is more helpful than all sorts of stuff all over the place. Um, as far as setting mood, so our instructional designers just shared this with me yesterday, and I'm going to put it in the chat. Maybe don't watch it now, but later. This is a really great video on, um, it's actually about captions, less than alt text, but the importance of using this information to set mood. All right, next one. Decorative or not? Pens. Nope. Yeah, this one is generally not decorative. So this is um, a picture that I have on my homepage and it's meant to be a way to welcome students, right? That's a really important part of humanizing our classes is having pictures of you. And so it's important to let students using screen readers know that I am including pictures of me. But I think it's also important to take it a step beyond just having the alt text read your instructor because that feels cold. And this is really meant to demonstrate that, you know, I'm smiling at you. I have my cute little puppy. I'm in front of a rose bush, right? So pull out some of those key elements. And again, focus on the mood of this. Your instructor welcoming you, welcoming you with a smile, right? That sort of alt text I think is more helpful than um, just your instructor. And yeah, um, the context is important and the purpose. So that idea of really focusing on the purpose of the image rather than the, the technical correct answer for the alt text um, is something that can be helpful for instructors. All right, last one, decorative or not? Yeah, yeah, this one is just pure eye candy. So there it is. Um, in the slide, it's just meant to separate the two, two sides. Okay. So jumping into complex images, these can be really challenging because you can't have an alt text that explains all this. And more importantly, uh, considering U Universal Design for Learning, UDL, even a student who can see this, they can see the colors, they can see everything fine. This is a lot of information. 
So for some students that are, are visual learners, this can be really helpful. For other students, it's confusing and maybe not helpful. So the approach to this is to explain the content either in the caption or in the surrounding text. And when, when you get the slides later, I have a link to the anatomy book that this is actually from. They did a really wonderful job in the paragraph below explaining all of this in, in kind of a list format from smallest to largest. And it, it was brilliant. And so they're all text just said, um, organization of structures described in text after image, something like that. So students know they're not missing out on anything. This one is a little bit more, um, it depends, but generally you want to avoid linking out to external pages because people have to go and then they have to come back and it kind of breaks the flow. So if it makes sense to include it below, that's better. But in some cases, describing this is going to break the flow of the page, like it's completely an aside and it's, it, um, it may be confusing. So you could either put it in a div box or in that case, you may need to link out. So it kind of depends. Um, yeah, and the 128 characters, I've seen different numbers, but I think the, the key is not too long, like keep it short. Ying, you have your hand up. Thanks. Um, I wasn't sure how you want to handle it, um, but since you have the image, and by the way, I teach biology too, so I love this. <laughs> I love this graph all the way from molecular from molecule level all the way to the human organ uh, system and stuff. Um, so I have kind of a related question because we recently uh, reviewed a poker course where instructor actually put up some infographics. And I was just wondering if you have about the same recommendation for infographics. Yeah, so an infographic, it depends on, on how it's structured. Like a lot of times it's pictures and text. And in that case, it might be cleaner to just make it as a canvas page. Mm -hmm. uh, if it's just an image with a lot of text, it's not gonna scale well. Like that, that I think is the biggest issue with text in an image is it doesn't zoom. But if if they need it and they really want it that way and it's it's too much to include in the flow of the page, then linking out to another canvas page with a link back, that's an important next step. So students don't get lost. So at the bottom or top of that, link back to where the original page was. It's it's okay. Um, yeah, and there's there's a really great question in the chat. This one makes me happy. Are emojis okay? Um, so I asked and emojis come with the built-in descriptor. So if you hover over them when you're selecting it, it has text. That's the text that's read. So yes, emojis are okay which is awesome because I love them. Okay. And this really, a lot of this will come down to context matters, right? So the same image can have different alt text based on the focus of the content, right? Um, so if this is a kinesi kinesiology class, you may want to describe the, the pose or name the event that this is at. If this is a physics class, you may want to discuss gravity, right? A fashion class, discuss the, the outfits. So the actual alt text for this will depend a lot on why it's in the book, right? So that question of what is the purpose that we were talking about with the PowerPoints, that's always the question to ask. And that can be really helpful when you have really complex images, right? So an image like this, you want to start with a question, what are students supposed to learn from it? Like, what is the pedagogical value of this image? And for this specific one, um, what the authors were wanting to do is demonstrate where there's telecommunication cables. And so the alt text would discuss things like, um, there's a lot of connections between the US and Europe, a lot of connections in, across the Mediterranean, but not a lot in Africa and Australia. Right. So giving that overview. And this one may be another one where they want to link out and discuss the um, the actual details of the image, which is a lot of work. And um, instructors will push back against like you need, mean I need to name all of these. Um, and 
I was just talking to uh, Amanda Tainter, who's an awesome uh, mentor. And she said, well, you know, I just drop this into AI and it creates a detailed description. And I tried that and it works. It was brilliant. It took me just a few seconds to have a really nice set of paragraphs describing what's in this image, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, and there is a lot happening in the chat. So I'm, I'm miss if I'm missing anything, Maria, Elena, let me know. Um, I just used, Helen, I just used uh, ChatGPT, the newest 4.0 version that's free for everyone, um, worked really well. And as I mentioned, if there's a lot of details, you may want to put it elsewhere because this one can be distracting. I think in the flow of the, the page, having all of these listed could be a bit much. Uh, for graphs, the key element is having a summary of the graph in the caption and maybe in the alt text if it's short enough. This one's a pretty easy graph. And then having the data on the same page in a table format so students can um, get the information that way. The table is super helpful for students using screen readers. And again, for UDL, it can be helpful for other students as well. But you do want to describe the general trends in the caption. Okay, before I move on to the next slide, is there anything in the chat I need to address? Yes, there's a question about um, CTE courses in which students need to analyze a photo and explain it would take away, so anyway. Well, yeah, um, so that's a really good question. And I'm actually gonna get to that in the inherently inaccessible content. Okay. So um, stay tuned because yeah, some in some cases there's nothing I can say in the alt text that wouldn't also remove the entire purpose of the image, right? So there there's ways to approach this and we'll, we'll discuss that. Yeah, thank you. And you, Marie, you can feel free to interrupt me if there's questions. Okay. Otherwise, I just forge ahead. So, okay. Um, so this slide is here because I just learned something new last week at the CCMS meeting. Um, and I think it was Moses and, and Helen that shared this information. I was really excited. So I wanted to share with everybody, um, including caption. So I keep saying uh, caption of the image. And a lot of times instructors will think the line below the image is a caption. Or if I take that line and write align it, students will know it's a caption. But a screen reader has no way to know that this line of text is linked to the image. And so the way to do that is you can add this figure element to Canvas. This is HTML code, kind of like the div box, which I realize now I didn't include the full code for you, but if you Google it, you can find it pretty easily and you can just cut and paste. Um, oh, and there's, I, I wanted to say, there's a current, a community idea in the Canvas community to have the figure element be wrapped into the rich text editor so you can click on it. So might I encourage everyone to go vote for that because this is super important so that students can get the information in the caption as linked to the image if they're using a screen reader. Okay. Yeah, um, can somebody link to the Canvas community, please? Okay. The last slides on alt text before I move to the inherently inaccessible content is we've been working really hard to include images that are inclusive and demonstrate diversity in our students so that all of our students feel welcome. And um, one, of, one of the instructors I was working with asked the question of how do I include the alt text to demonstrate the, that I'm in, being inclusive without also sounding kind of tokenizing and like make it sound awkward. And I don't have an answer. So I, I just wanted to pose the question. Um, if anyone has suggestions on how to do this, you can put them in the chat. Um, I'm actually running a little short on time, so I'm not gonna have the discussion on this, but it's something to think about. Like how do we create alt text that demonstrates inclusion without also feeling tokenizing? Okay, but we are going to move on to 
inherently inaccessible documents and content. So this is back to the question about um, CTE. Okay, so examples of an inherently accessible content. And these are just a few that have come up. There are others, I'm sure, but these are just to give a sense of, of the types of content that be, can be inaccessible. Uh, so I, again, I teach biology. So we have these kind of papers with circles that students are supposed to look at the microscope and draw what's in the microscope. Like that's a really hard one. I'm gonna present solutions later. So problems on this slide, solutions on the next one. Um, there's also images that just can't be described. A, an astronomy instructor that had this really nice picture of the constellations. That's way too much. And how would you even describe that in text without being confusing, right? Um, another one that's come up recently is in world language classes where the purpose of the outcome is for students to listen and translate the word into English. And so this is, Jennifer, to your point, is um, does it fun fundamentally alter the purpose of the, the content, so not image in this case, but the audio. This is the question to ask instructors because um, there is content that is hard to make accessible and there's content that's impossible to make accessible, right? Like those are different. Is it just hard and therefore you just need to do it like, you, you know, or is it truly inherently inaccessible? So some strategies. Provide all students with alternative formats. So for example, in my example of drawing, right? I have the paper that I give to students, but I also have a Word or a Google Doc where they can draw electronically, right? Or, or answer the questions electronically. This again is helpful for a variety of students. So not just students that can't draw on the paper, but students that may prefer to draw digitally. For visual information that can't be described, um, and this one I love, this this was actually, I don't know, 20 years ago, and I was talking to someone at the Accessibility Center about the constellation issue I was having, and they said, well, you can create a, a you know, print it out and then put raised glue dots on all the stars, and I thought that was just the most brilliant thing, right? Like, that is really the only way to make that accessible, but I'm not going to be able to have that in my online class. So this is something that you want to have planned ahead of time, right? So that's kind of um, the next step is I have an alternative plan that I can't just, I can't include the raised glue dots in my class, but I have a plan for students that need it. And the important thing for this is to think about this ahead of time. This is not like a student tells me they have an issue and now I'm starting to think about what do I do? So this is an equally effective alternate access plan. And the key to consider is, are there alternative ways for students to meet the learning outcome? And the example that, that's been most challenging is the audio in a world language class. Like if the outcome is, is to listen and translate, then no, there isn't. But do we want to say that this means that a student who can't hear the audio doesn't get to take a Spanish class? Also no, right? So you really want to think about, is there a different way that a student can meet that same outcome so that they can learn the content, even though they can't you know, hear the audio? As I mentioned, it's super important to plan for these ahead of time, but this is also often really complicated. And the reason you want to plan ahead of time is so that you can reach out to people such as your DSPS folks or the Accessibility Center. Um, actually, if someone could drop the Accessibility Center's link in the chat, that would be helpful because they're amazing. Like that's where I go to ask these random questions about what do I do about? And they always come up with a really great solution. There's also in the Vision Resource Center a place to pose questions. And after I'm, I'm done with this section, I'll, I'll find that link because I don't have it at top of mind. But that's why you want to do it ahead of time so you can think ahead about what am I going to do if. And of course, there's always going to be things that come up that you just didn't think about. I didn't think about a student that would have this kind of, of complication. 
Um, and then you can reach out to folks later. And the last slide for this, um, is, and I realized I went through this very, very quickly. So hopefully uh, this was helpful, but I, I had limited time. So I was, I was forging ahead. So here's the last slide. This, the importance of the syllabus. And this is something that really was only brought to my attention recently because we participated in the accessibility capability maturity model through our accessibility center. And this was one of the milestones they had is to create and update um, accessibility statements for our course content. Pause and aside, if your college hasn't gone through the um, ACMM with our Accessibility Center, highly encourage you to, to do that. They did a really wonderful job reaching out to all of our campus constituents and helping them understand what needs to happen so that we can be as inclusive and accessible as possible. And one of the and they they help with things that you didn't think about. So the one thing I didn't think about is in my syllabus, there is the accommodation statement, right? If you need accommodations, here's DSPS and I will help you. But the added piece that they they mentioned that I thought was super helpful is to have in your syllabus information about content that's going to be inherently inaccessible. We have pictures of constellations. Um, if you have uh, challenges with your, if you have reduced vision, please reach out to me early so that I can create content that is accessible for you. This is really helpful for students that may not have um, accommodations, but they need it because sometimes they don't really want to reach out and schedule um, with uh, register with DSPS. It's also helpful because it sends the message to all students, even if they don't need the visual accommodation that I'm here to work with you. And if you run into issues, reach out to me, we'll work through this together. So it's a really helpful statement to have in your syllabus. And the important piece to this when you're helping instructors with this is it's not meant to be a workaround, right? This is not like saying, I didn't feel like writing alt text, therefore there's problems in this course. This is for that inherently inaccessible content. Okay. So that was that was the end of that. Is there questions in the chat to address before I turn it back over to Sochi? We have a hand up. All okay. right. Um, so, um, but thank you so much. And uh, my question is, I create a lecture notes, which is accessible uh, because I use Word and the math type, it's accessible, no problem. But what happens is using the lecture notes, which is accessible, I hand write the answers uh, with all the steps. So now uh, with using the stylus, I'm writing in the tablet. Now I save that as a PDF. I don't know how I can make the handwritten notes accessible. So the video is accessible because I have a captions there. Then I teach them and I show them the steps. The video is recorded and that is accessible. But after the video, I post this uh, worked out notes as a reference for them to check out that's not accessible. So will that be okay because I have the video that is captioned that go over these steps and having this uh, PDF uploaded with the written steps that's not uh, accessible. So I don't know how to make it. Is the, is it okay or I need to, what are the steps to make it? So um, that actually raises a really interesting question about videos and captions. Cause a lot of times we think about captioning what we say, which is great for students that can't hear, but we don't caption what is on the screen which means that students that can't see the images are just not getting that information. So we often talk about videos, captions for, for one reason, but we miss the other reason entirely. Um, and so Helen, yeah, to your point, audio descriptions are, are the way to go with that. Um, or, and actually audio descriptions are a really good way to go with that. And you can build it into your, your content that you're saying. So when you're writing on the screen, um, also say, you know, here's what I'm doing. This is a 
It's been a while since I took math. This is a, a whatever symbol and notice that I'm writing this thing above it, which again, UDL means that it's more helpful for all students that may not be catching what you're writing because they're not recognizing that as an important math symbol or remembering what it is. So great question. Uh, one last question, Suzanne. Moses is asking thoughts on image macro memes. So I don't know what that is. Um, so, anyone? Uh, memes with text on them. Oh, oh. Yeah, that's that's complicated. So in general, so that that again, you want to go back to to purpose, right? If it's just meant to be a light joke. Then, then you could in the alt text kind of describe describe the joke itself. Um, but again, that with the zooming in um, isn't going to be helpful for a student that needs to zoom in but doesn't actually use a screen reader. So you you could just transcribe it in the in the caption um, so that all students get the joke. So I'm I'm on Reddit and I really like the explain the joke community because I don't get most of the memes. I, I'm just too old, I guess. Um, so there are students that may not get the joke and describing it might might be helpful for everybody. Great question. All right. Well, thank you so much, Suzanne, for that uh, presentation that was so informative and uh, you've given us a lot of uh, great information to think about and to start implementing uh, as we review our courses. Uh, next, we're going to go ahead and move forward uh, let's see, we have our first college spotlight. It's El Camino Community College and it's Moses and Rhea that are here. So um, I've given you the power to share your screen, Moses and Rhea. So go ahead. All right, thank you, Sochi. Uh, let me just kick us into presentation mode. Is that still visible? Great. Yes. Pop this chat up and get it over on the side in case we need that. Um, thank you so much. I am Moses Wolfenstein. I'm the distance education faculty coordinator here at El Camino College. And I'm Ria Lewitsky. I teach in humanities. I am the poker co-lead and I am also our lead reviewer. All right. So we are here to talk to you about how we've been approaching accessibility in reviewing here at El Camino. Um, and it's it's evolved over time, but uh, Ria uh, is going to give you kind of an overview of our of our process and where accessibility touches uh, on the process. Yeah, so this is a bird's eye view of our poker process. We have seven steps to our process, and we thought we would show it, show you this way so you can see where we integrate section D in all of our steps. So um, as you can see, we have seven steps total, and out of those seven, we actually fold in section D five times. So we're gonna go through those more specifically, but um, it touches on five different areas out of the seven steps that we go through to um, achieve full alignment. So we're gonna go through those uh, right now. All right, um, before we do, what is in our accessibility toolkit here at Elco? Uh, the review tools that we have are, of course, uh, PopeTech and the Canvas Accessibility Checker. Um, and we, uh, if you have not yet gotten the PopeTech dashboard in place for your campus, I know this has probably come up at, I think, the last uh, poker norming session. Like, reach out and do it. It's it's an absolute game changer. Um, we also, uh, we are a Microsoft campus, so we have the Microsoft Office Accessibility Tools, uh, and those are, are pretty important. And then uh, Equidox, which uh, again, if you don't have anybody on your campus who has access to that, that comes back to the CCC Accessibility Center and definitely reach out and get it for at least somebody. In our case, uh, we currently only have the one license for our accessibility reviewer, and you will hear more about that. Uh, then in our toolkit, we of course have our peer review team. Uh, everyone has done the at one section D norming training. So in addition to, to the regular poker, poker training, we made sure everybody did that. Um, we have our accessibility reviewer, uh, which we know this is kind of a, a, a very nice 
feature that we have on our campus. Our instructional designer, when we hired that position in the middle of COVID uh, at our campus, it was like, yeah, I guess maybe you need more than two people involved with distance education. Uh, we made sure that accessibility was one of the key uh, position requirements. So he is uh, our local accessibility expert, uh, in addition to you know our special resource center uh, for our, uh, you know deeper needs that are that are more at the student support level. Um, and then uh, we have three required presentations that are part of our onboarding. Uh, and the, the third one is making your online course fully accessible. Uh, you'll hear a little bit more about that in, in a minute. And then uh, we have a module in our Canvas poker shell that has additional resources like websites that our faculty can uh, refer to if they need help and support. And I think we're probably going to add a couple more after today. All right, so taking us back to the seven steps, and we will go over five of those steps where accessibility has been integrated into those. So at step one, which is where our faculty are choosing the online course that they are going to put through the review, um, we this is the most recent um, accessibility addition, if you will. Um, we call it the accessibility preview option. And what we do here is when faculty are choosing their course to put through review, um, they can also ask to have one of their, uh, they can ask to have their course previewed for accessibility. And now what that means is, um, is we will have our accessibility reviewer take a look at one of their existing shells that they, they've, uh, if they've already taught the course to do a um, kind of like a, a scan of their course to give an estimate of the accessibility lift that the faculty will face later in the process. And so they'll get back to them and say, you know, um, they may have like a light standard or heavy lift of accessibility to expect later in the course. Um, our accessibility reviewer, Ryan, will look at, say, their documents, their files, their trans, their, um, if their videos have uh, captions. And so this will help the faculty member to make a better decision from the beginning if that is a course that they would like to put through the review process. It's also helpful to the uh, lead and accessibility reviewers up front so that if that is the course they wanna choose, we can help them from the beginning with remediation. So we can already get them the tools that they need uh, if they need to start remediating PDF files, if they need to start getting transcriptions or audio, I'm um, sorry, uh, captioning going, we can start helping them right away through the process. We found that this was necessary. The rationale for this is that we had the um, unfortunate situation of a few faculty who had gotten through our seven step process. They made it to step seven, which is our accessibility review step. And they had these incredible courses. And when they got to the accessibility review step, they found that they had such a huge lift that they were completely overwhelmed with what they had to do that they uh, were too discouraged to continue. They had so many images that they had to provide alt text for. They had so much caption and they had to do. Um, it was it was so overwhelming that, that they actually didn't complete the process. And it was so uh, disappointing to find that these really incredible courses were not going to be completed for this reason. And so we thought by putting in this actual really quick, easy step at the beginning, this preview, where we can have our accessibility reviewer just do a quick scan of their course to say, hey, this could be a pretty heavy lift later on. Are you sure you want to do this? Or if you do want to do this, let's start tackling it from now so that by the time you get to step seven, it's not so challenging. Um, and we have found already that this has been actually a, a, pretty, a pretty helpful move on, on everybody's part. All right. So after step one, the next place where accessibility reviewing comes into play is the accessibility self-review that we have faculty do at step four. So basically, 
um, there's a step where they get a, a single module reviewed, we give them the thumbs up, they go in and you know do the rest of their important edit and, and true up their course. And we have a self-reviewing checklist that we made for them, which we presented on at OTC last year, that um, kind of streamlines the reviewing process in general and which we have integrated accessibility into it. So the rationale is that, hey, this is a good time for our poker faculty to start remediating their accessibility issues themselves that they might have carried over from previous builds. Uh, they do their course cleanup and accessibility prep on, with a checklist. Uh, it includes things like arranging files into two folders, deleting those unused files, attempting to remediate PDFs, or if possible, maybe get rid of them and replace them with something that's not a PDF. Um, and you know, going through their page, using the dashboard, using Pope Tech page by page, um, and the built-in Canvas reviewer. Uh, many faculty have reported it is their first time using or even hearing of Pope Tech, um, which I consider to be a personal failure on my part in my uh, certification of them. <laughs> it's always a constant work in progress. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, you know, it's been it's been an effective step for them uh, from from what we can tell. From there, we get to the peer review at step five. So, uh, our rationale here is along with sections A through C, peer reviewers should apply their knowledge gained from the section D training uh, and expertise concerning accessibility during the peer review stage. Uh, the peer reviewers are only asked to evaluate accessibility elements for what they have been trained in, so D1 through D7. Uh, if they have feedback on other elements because they have some accessibility expertise to provide, that's great, but we're not requiring them in this stage of the review process to do it. Um, so faculty can learn and fix the more basic stuff at this point, and the peer reviewer can focus more on A through C, but still highlight parts of D that often have direct connections to other rubric criteria. I think this is something that you all are probably pretty familiar with uh, by now, where there, there are elements, uh, certainly in like section A, where it's like, oh, you know, this is also a section D thing. Uh, we got a question. When was the self-review checklist presented? I'd like to search for this session. Uh, last year at OTC. And um, we will, you know, feel free if you can't find it, contact us off offline. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we're happy to share. Following the peer review is our lead review step. And that's when it comes to me. The lead reviewer generally has more expertise and knowledge regarding accessibility than the peer reviewers um, generally. <laughs> Uh, the, so th that's when I do a full section D review. Um, that's also because I have access to the Pope Tech dashboard. So I can start with that and then I will go through all of section D. Um, it's still a lot of work, but, uh, thankfully the peer reviewer has at least helped out significantly by going through D1 through D7. Um, I can finish up the second half and, um, yeah, so now we've done a, a second full pass on section D uh, with the lead review. And then the last one, I believe that's, oh, is that me? I don't know, what slide is this? This is me, okay. And then the final pass, now we are at step seven, and this is where the accessibility reviewer comes in who definitely has more expertise and knowledge regarding accessibility than me, the lead reviewer. And now this approach is a little bit different. The accessibility reviewer, um, again, does a full pass on section D, but engages in a dialogue with the faculty member until all elements are aligned. So they'll pair up, they'll kind of do a back and forth. And that again is a bit of work, um, but with all of the, but with that preview step in place way back at step one, um, it's now assumed that a bit more remediating has taken place since the beginning. So it shouldn't be such a big shock by step seven. A lot of things should have been fixed or worked on along the way. And, um, you know, it's it, there should be a lot kind of less to, to, to hash out by the end at step seven here. And that covers the five places in our seven step process where section D is integrated um, and where all of the parts of our toolkit kind of come out. Um, I guess we didn't talk about where our presentation for accessibility comes in that does, I think that was over in um, our self-review, about around the time of our self-review is when our faculty have to complete the um, presentation on making your course fully accessible. That's when they complete that presentation and then they do their own self-review and look and do the, um, 
accessibility review on that. And we tried to get them to come to a live session of it, but we have it recorded in case they missed it or in case they attended it earlier in the process and and need to review it. And we, you know, in the way that we built our our poker canvas shell, it's like, oh yeah, by the way, if you need to look at this thing again, <laughs> go ahead and watch it now. Mm -hmm. Um, so strategies, uh, kind of lifting up what we do to a high level. Um, take advantage of that at one section D training for your reviewers. Cannot encourage you to do that enough. Mm -hmm. Provide accessibility training for faculty at the start of the poker process. Get them going on that ASAP. Uh, emphasize the overlap between accessibility criteria that are directly con connected to other rubric criteria. For example, D1 heading styles uh, and A6 page level chunking. Mm -hmm. Offer a pre-review, uh, roughly one module or check files at the start of the process. Break section D criteria into natural grouping, groupings for review at different stages of the process. I think this is our biggest win right now. Mm -hmm. Also lean into UDL, such as when dealing with the questions of PDFs. Uh, take advantage of OER resources and funding when possible. We just hit on this recently because we have some OERs that need remediating, but there's some funding that the faculty who uh, either created them or have access to them might be able to take advantage of. And keep an eye on developing AI tools. All right. Thank you, Moses and Rhea. Okay, questions. Uh, Ying, go ahead. Thank you, Moses and, and Rhea. Uh, wonderful presentation. Um, I think early on, when you guys were talking about the onboarding process, you actually mentioned that the, the poker faculty actually needs to do like three presentations. Uh, one of them, the second one is about accessibility. I was just wondering, um, are those just like Zoom meeting, with the poker leads, with the faculty, and then they talk about their courses with you. I see nodding. <laughs> yeah, there, there are three Zoom presentations. The first two are hosted by Moses and me. Um, one of them goes over the CDC rubric. That's the introductory one and the poker process, but mostly it's getting acquainted with the rubric. The second one is for course mapping, because we ask our participants to complete a course map. And then the third one is hosted by me and the our accessibility reviewer, and that is on the um, on accessibility. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I'm seeing that concern about faculty who have a lot of remediating to do and then decide not to do the poker process. But yeah, so... I'll, I'll say that I have like two concerns here uh, in, this, in this context. So I think honestly, the faculty who decide like, oh my God, there's too much here and I'm not sure how to approach it. They at least are putting together a rem remediation plan. They're aware of their issues and they are generally more likely to be chipping away at it. Um, and from a standpoint, from, from the legal standpoint, that at least is like, okay, you have a plan in place and that's like the key checkbox. And obviously, you know, towards our actual obligation to all of our students uh, getting there eventually. And some of this, honestly, um, we just learned some stuff today that we've been kind of sourcing around the edge of with regard to the images that can't be remediated problem. Because one of those faculty is, in fact, a natural sciences faculty. And it was not a question of assessment of uh, instructional content, but assessment content. Right. And, you know, how the heck do you even do this? Um but I'll tell you that my real terror is the fact that poker reveals these issues in courses, but it is obviously the tip of the iceberg in terms of the accessibility um, needs on campus. And we do not have any, any mechanism that we can actually pull levers on in terms of getting faculty in general. Uh, you know, all we can do is incentivize them to participate in these types of activities and offer the trainings. But there's like, you know, there's a kind of hard contract wall beyond that, right? So, yeah. All right, any other questions? All right, thank you so much, uh, Moses and Rhea for presenting that. That was I, very, very helpful. Um, I, I think it's great to see uh, everyone's different process and, you know, um, maybe take some of that back to your college and, you know, figure out uh, how we can make this process better. Um, okay, so we are going to go ahead and continue. Uh, we have another college spotlight. Uh, Betsy uh, from Woodland Community College is going to present on how they also handle their 
um, review, I'm sorry, their accessibility uh, review in at their college. Great, thank you. I'm gonna go ahead and share. Hopefully I'm sharing. Yes. Are you seeing my PowerPoint? I think yes. no. Yes. You are. Okay, all right, let me do that again. Oh, it didn't look like it to me. Okay, let me try again. Okay, it just looks funny on my screen. So anyway, um, thank you. I I'm actually gonna do a high level overview. I really appreciate all the detail people have gone into and now I wanna change a lot of what we do. <laughs> But I'm going to give you kind of the, the high level uh, viewpoint that we, we really are looking at accessibility um, no matter the modality, right? Because we really want to catch people at all entry points into teaching. And so I'm going to be focusing on online teaching, but I'm going to show you how people have often sort of accidentally tripped on accessibility as well as before they've even become um, online instructors in many cases. So my name is Betsy Allen. I'm at Woodland Community College and just... Um, really quickly, when I, I'm a transplant to California many years ago, but I always have to look up people's colleges, like where you're at. So people think we're down at like in Woodland Hills, like, you know, south, we're north, we're just above Sacramento, and we're three counties. Actually, it's a really large geographic area, but we're a tiny college. So just so you have a clue where I'm, I am at right now as I speak. Um, and I'm going to kind of go over the, this roadmap of accessibility. It's really, I think, multiple layers. I was trying to figure out how to best visualize this, but I think a roadmap is easier to follow. Um, and you'll see on this roadmap, the first point is at, with face-to-face -face teaching. So as soon as people are new instructors here, they usually start um, with face-to-face uh, -face teaching still to this day here. So we, we catch folks then and make them aware. Um, and then in order to teach online, and I think this is unique about our college, in order to teach online, you must go through poker and you must put through one asynchronous class only at this point. So eventually we're going to be, you know, then we'll take in our high flex, then we'll take in our hybrid, so forth. But um, right now, everybody's got to get one through. And so because of that, um, and that's approved by our Senate and our union, um, because of that, that helps us kind of get uh, our heads around accessibility um, a little bit faster, I think, with some faculty. Um, so knowing that all faculty who will want to be eligible to teach online must put one course through poker, so they are all preparing for poker. So we'll talk about how we catch them at that preparation stage. Once they've gotten uh, their review back, then we're there for them to support um, the remediation work um, there. So we can talk about what that looks like. And then ongoing, uh, we do periodic accessibility and RSI checks combined. And so that's when I go in as instructional designer um, to give some quick feedback. And this is not punitive in any way, that's just to provide collegial support. I should also mention I'm faculty instructional designer as well, which can make a little bit of a difference, I think, in having access into courses and that feeling of peer mentorship. Okay, so at the face-to-face -face level, we do a training um, at, usually in the fall, sometimes we repeat it in the spring every year. We work through four scenarios together as a group. We teach this in a high flex way so that we can reach our other two sites that I showed you are pretty far away. <laughs> so we get everybody involved. It also gives them the experience that they are going to be teaching high flex in the future, what it's like, right, to be in one of those classrooms. So we do activities that kind of strain that modality as well. Um, when we talk about how to email students, uh, thinking about accessibility when we are reposting flyers that come from various offices. And actually, we um, also point them, we don't teach them all of this. We work them through these scenarios. They're really getting exposed to like D1 through D7 um, in that rubric uh, in all of these. And then we're pointing them to other um, trainings that we have. So we have one on flyers as well that we share also with student services. Um, sharing video and audio with your students and obviously sharing your, your slides, what that might look like. So a good example from today as well. So hopefully after doing that training, if you're an online instructor or if you're a face-to-face -face instructor first, you have some awareness anyway. You know to ask questions, you know to come to me, you know we have office hours, you know where all our trainings are. Um, one thing that came up that's proved to be a really important tool that we're revisiting actually um, this summer in, in revising some things is an online uh, ready tech skills checklist. And on that checklist, we had accessibility as one of our you know, skills that you must have, right? 
And we developed this because when we went to COVID, you know, we went online for COVID, we had to very quickly assess who needed the most support to get online. Um, and we were, we were just kind of looking at, you know, we were saying red light, green light, uh, yellow light, and our red lights we had to help first, right? Um, and we wanted to make sure work through these checklists with them in our different workshops we were running on campus for three days before we shut down. Um, and so our team broke up and we had the checklist we were running through. What is great about that checklist, it's become our source for outcomes in any trainings that we have. We're trying to link to that so that you can kind of self-assess as an instructor. Um, it's something that we give out at our new part-time faculty orientation um, so that you can self-assess. Um, we don't we don't make you do anything. It's for you to create your own path and learning and to give you some guidance. And we feel that if you can do these things, you're going to be capable of pivoting to online at any moment if you have to or to begin um, online teaching if you're like an emergency hire right away and you can't go through our official process. Um, Betsy, there's a question about sharing the checklist. Would you be able to do that? If not? Yeah, actually, wait. So we are, let me just, I can. That's fine. I want to share my, I have it right here, but we're actually updating it, but I can definitely share it out to the group. Um, I'm updating because some of our technology has changed. Um, so yeah, but I will definitely share it out. Um, the, actually, if I, one thing I did do is I hid a slide in here in case somebody asked. So this is an ugly slide. Um, let me just unhide it for a second. And then, uh, okay, so this gives you an idea. This is the old checklist that we haven't updated yet. Um, but we've been using, so obviously like my Canvas page, number one is basically my Canvas pages are accessible. Um, my course doesn't include just external links, but I've turned them into Canvas pages, right? Every page passes the built-in checker. So you, you can see what we're doing there. And when we were sitting down, when this is COVID, we were sitting down at COVID, we were making sure they could demonstrate to us all those things. And if they weren't, we would do like little impromptu um, teachings. We've since used this, like I said, we're making sure our trainees can align to these different um, skills under accessibility. This actual checklist includes other items. Um, I had a note somewhere around here with the other items, but um, like Zoom readiness and Canvas basics, things like that. Uh, this year we uh, combined with our sister college, which is Yuba College, we did a district-wide um, training. This is an accessibility virtual hike. We'll actually be doing, Sandy and I will be doing a presentation at OTC. Um, so this is just the trailer, not, <laughs> not everything. But um, because we had that CVC uh, emergency funds, everybody got for um, additional professional development. We thought, let's combine forces. Let's make this really social, really fun, because accessibility can be a little dry. I love it. But not everybody wants to just sink their teeth into it. So we thought, let's pair it with something fun. And everyone dreams maybe of, of hiking the Pacific Crest Trail. And so that's what we did. Everything was themed like, like you were walking along with your tramoli and we had videos that we had you know pulled in of the trail and you were like accidentally learn accessibility, hopefully, right, as you're going through. And the other thing we did with it, because we wanted to pull in a wide, any modality of an instructor in any level, what we did is everybody goes through a basic content sort of uh, bit of, you know, uh, pages, and then you get hit the fork in the road. And so you can say, um, you know what, I just want to solidify what I just learned. I'm going to go sit by the lake and they do a discussion activity there. Um, or you can say, I know this, this is easy. Um, let me climb the summit. And so we give them something challenging, like complex images. But after having heard um, Suzanne, I think I need to touch that one up a little bit, but you know, we're giving them a little bit extra. So we're not just talking about alt text, but we're talking about complex image situations. So um, that's what we did there. Um, that was really effective, I think, in getting people excited to learn more and really digging into, um, you know, their spreadsheets and their economics courses and, and things that they didn't want to look at before. So um, that's, again, just trying to think about accessibility beyond online helps when you're coming into poker, you've already got people who are really aware. Um, so now let's say you're you're ready, you're turning in a course for poker. Again, one course per online faculty. And we do lots of targeted workshops. Uh, we actually do 16 in the fall semester alone. Um, and some of them are on other sections of the rubric, but these are half hour, just kind of shots in the arm. And we'll kind of give people a heads up. Like, I think this one's gonna work for you. Um, 
So we do one on PowerPoint slides, Canvas page accessibility. We do uh, the Canvas pages, uh, the PDFs to Canvas pages is a huge one because I think people don't realize the lift that's involved there. And it's, it's not hard, but it's a lift, right? Um, and looking at accessible websites, we share some ideas from um, instructors who have had issues with accessible websites that they must use and what we did either in building Canvas pages out or workarounds um, to make it accessible. Um, and then anytime we have a technology training, we talk about accessibility and we have a poker uh, prep Canvas site, much like, you know, there's a lot of the colleges have presented on theirs in the past. Ours is something similar to that. And we have a lot of um, accessibility, obviously, um, links and resources in there. So once you get a review, and we have a tiny but mighty team, we have eight reviewers, if you don't count me, and I have one, it kind of floats back and forth, it depends. Um, we do all sections, we do A through D as reviewers. I try to pick off maybe difficult ones because I vet them as the, um, the lead. So I try to pick off ones that might be challenging and I might do their section D for them, but our reviewers are totally capable to do A through D. They know to come to me with questions. And then sometimes I go to Sochi with questions <laughs> or the accessibility center it used to be Helen that we would go to for questions. Um, we also do regular internal norming. And this is a time where we kind of share out who's going to present at that norming session. And we, we always bring it, we bring in one section A through C of how we attacked it in one course. And then um, a tricky accessibility situation is usually how we end those and we talk about those. Um, one thing I have to mention, not all our people are going for a poker badge. Okay, it's for the CVC badge. We use poker um, as a way to give feedback and to, to identify resources for folks. So you might come through poker and we say, whoa, there's like a year's worth of accessibility <laughs> remediation here. We need to help you, right? So we have what's called the local level. So local is what we, we require of all courses. You're 100% accessible and you're 70% accessible A through C. Now we have extensions we can give you. If you're 70% accessible A through C, which means you can miss one on B and C and up to two on A. Um, you're 100, let's say you're 70 or to 100% on A through C, but you're still lacking in D, but it's pretty good, but you've got something like a chemistry handbook. And I'm like, oh, we did this chemistry handbook with the instructor. And I'll talk to you in a minute. We have a, a team of accessibility um, students who are trained in this work to help the lift with some of these um, documents that maybe aren't complex, but they're huge to do. So this is a time for us, we use poker to identify these sort of large scale projects that might impact several sections of a course. Um, and that's the kind of thing that we like to um, train our accessibility students to do um, to help with that lift. They don't do the instructor's work for them. They just help with these really long projects. Um, our poker, we have now our own version of the poker uh, form, which looks a lot like somebody's version of the poker form, probably Santa Rosa's that we've added on to, right? Um, but we've now added, you have to complete, if you have publisher content, you must complete the LTI process with IT. And so that allows us to ensure that we vet it for accessibility and security with them. This is the step where you would generate your EEAAP that Suzanne already said what that acronym was. So I won't repeat, we just call it the accommodation plan. Um, uh, so this is that's the process there. And I just check as lead reviewer that that's been done, that there's a record for that and it, that's been filed. So the assistance that you get during poker, um, in the form that we give back, we actually do provide links uh, often to targeted videos or tutorials if we think that the person needs that. Sometimes it's just a mention like, oh, you didn't get the headings on this page, you know, but they've got it everywhere else. Um, we always have weekly design instructional hour, or instructional design hours and DE office hours as well. Um, and then we have our poker prep course that we might refer people back to as well if they haven't um, mastered some of those skills still. So these are our latest, they're just graduated, our accessibility still workers and I've had them for two years and now I'm going to have to train a whole new crew, which makes me like, oh no. Um, Adriana and Alex are amazing. They work remotely with me, um, which I know a lot of people go, oh no, remote work. So if you ever want to reach out, if you, you're interested in doing something like this, I'd be happy to talk to you. First of all, you have to pick fabulous students, but um, how we manage work online is has been an interesting and they've always come up with great ideas as well. So they get the projects that we've identified through poker 
that I that I, I mentioned, we prioritize them based on maybe the impact. If we have a course, it must come online. Like we had this water course, we were getting a retired professor from UC Davis. We had to help him get online as fast as we could. He had this beautiful free, you know, PDF textbook, 400 pages. How is he going to do that, right? In in a matter of months. And so Adriana and Alex, um, you know, would work on something like that to help um, get that particular course online and accessible. Um, usually these are large projects, so the students um, will take some time to learn. Like, for example, um, they always start off with Canvas page accessibility, and their first assignment is to take a PDF article and um, make it a, an accessible Canvas page so that they can become really good at that and they can help pick that up for instructors who are, you know, really working on a time crunch to get their accessibility work done. Um, also, I just want to mention, if you do offer this kind of training to students, we've had uh, marvelous feedback from, from colleges, four-year schools, reaching out to us, letting us know that these skills that the students are coming to them with in, as workers, you know, in IT or um, supporting instructional design are really unique. And so, um, so you see Berkeley's reached out to us, to, to the College of Engineering reached out to us, and, and so this is a really fabulous opportunity you're offering students, as well as Sac State. So just know that don't, don't, this is, this is knowledge for everybody to, you know, be Section 508 compliant is, is a fabulous thing. Ongoing, we do periodic RSI accessibility checks. We do not do all courses. We usually do about 20%. Um, at least once a year, we've been really not great with even hitting the 20%. We probably do about 10% because just all that's on our plate. But this is an opportunity for us to, we let people know that you your course was uh, you know, randomly selected and um, we offer collegial support at that time. I'm just giving you an example. This is not an actual communication faculty member, right? But we'll, you know, just like poker, uh, you know, how you write up your poker comments. We're like, hey, we saw this fabulous stuff going on, and just you know, when we were in there, we saw these couple things. Here's some resources we thought might be helpful. Now we also have an RSI comment as well on there, so um, that folks know, you know, take a look at those things. Um, and then this is for the future. This is what I'm working on this summer, and I just wanted to share this out. Um, so we have a faculty and staff development center. It's a Canvas site that all our faculty are enrolled in. And there's actually lots of buttons on that page, but one of the buttons takes into professional development um, resources. So th these are all self-paced or videos. Um, what I'm doing this year, usually we're linking out to other shells that we have that have these other trainings. What I'm doing this year is bringing the um, trainings that align to that skills, the tech skills checklist that I was talking about and bring them into as modules in this uh, actual course so that I can put the outcomes, the checklist as outcomes in there. And then I'm hoping because we have a lot of faculty that will say that they are, you know, quote unquote OCD, but they can't have things unchecked. And I'm really hoping if they have outcomes that haven't been met, that they will want to go find that targeted training and um, get themselves up to speed on um, you know, whatever, video captioning or whatever it is that they need to learn. Um, so that's just uh, on the horizon. That is what I'll be working on. At OTC, if I'm not presenting, I'll probably be working on this. So that's it. That's basically our roadmap. I just wanted to see if there's any questions. I went through a lot really fast. Thank you, Betsy. I think everyone is jealous about your Academic Senate uh, voting for uh, everybody that teaches online to go through that process. Um, there is a question. Um, Moses is asking, oh, I lost it. Oh, there it is. <laughs> Did the periodic RSI checks get set and approved or were you able to just implement the practice? Yeah, that was actually in our last or 2022 uh, update of our DE handbook. We put, um, and I'd be happy to share that with you. Um, uh, I would say it's called like reasons for course entry and two reasons for course entry would be RSI, uh, checking on RSI and checking on accessibility. And since we have um, uh, accreditation coming up for fall, like we're trying to make sure we get good feedback. Right now we still have a lot of people doing poker. So we feel like we're catching it there, um, at least in terms of design and then in implementation with these checks is really helpful. But again, these are also, we. this is a faculty owned process. So it's not, punitive. It's not going to, I know some places I've heard that some checks can get you like kicked out of a course or something. That's not true here. Um, it is just to make you aware that these are the resources to support your work. Nice. Thank you. Any other questions uh, for Betsy? 
I think we're good. Betsy, thank you so much for this thank presentation. You. This has been, uh, I'm really happy that we had uh, Moses and Rhea present on, you know, uh, with a poker team that has, uh, you know, some resources that some of us may not have. But then we had Betsy also presenting uh, with a team that, you know, they do their own accessibility checks all around. So I'm glad that, um, that we were able to have both of those colleges present to kind of see, again, the difference between, um, you know, the difference from college to college and the resources that we have. Uh, available. And I do think that having student workers um, trained in accessibility, if we could all get that, wouldn't awesome. that be wonderful? Yes. Right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, continue. We just have, I just have a few more things to share with you. If I can just find the, oh, there it is, the big green button to share my screen. I couldn't see it. <laughs> Okay, um, so I do want to talk a little bit, uh, a few more things on accessibility. Um, so there are going to be some upcoming Title II changes. You may already know about these changes, but I just wanted to give you a very brief overview. And this is uh, doing research on my own and, you know, reading emails and things like that. So there are changes coming up. Um, basically, um, all web content is going to have to be accessible. Um, this includes mobile apps, and then there is a timeline for compliance. So you can see the timeline there. Um, Maria Elena and I looked at these slides and we had a big discussion about that timeline. And what does a total population of 50,000 or more mean? Uh, we, you know, uh, we weren't able to come to a conclusion. Maybe if we did further reading, we could find greater detail on that. But um, I feel that for us uh, in that are involved in poker, in course design, in reviewing courses for accessibility, these Title II changes are really good for us um, because I get this a lot from poker leads. They say, you know, we have um, our student resources, you know, we want them to be linked in our Canvas uh, pages, for example, in our in our modules. And you know the student resources will link out to our college's website, but our college's website is not accessible. Like, what do I do about that? Do I just link it and leave it alone? Do I have to, you know, put that information in a Canvas page? So the right thing to do is to put that information in a Canvas page and make it accessible, you know. But that's more work for us. Um, but this Title II change, for example, for our college's websites. This would, will basically mean that our college will be responsible for making their websites or our websites accessible. Um, because I don't know how many of you poker leads have talked to somebody um, at your college and said, hey, you know, this website has to be accessible. All of these links with PDFs that you have, they need to be accessible. And um, I, I don't think I'm alone where, you know, it's like, it's like if nobody's listening. So anyhow, um, these Title II changes, um, I think are gonna be a good thing for all of us. Um, but, uh, you know, we'll we'll just have to wait on the timeline. I say April, 2027, let's shoot for that um, because of those weird numbers, the 50,000 less or more. Anyway, I just wanted to give you um, a little glimpse into that so that we're all aware. Oh, I see Suzanne, maybe Suzanne, Hi. more yes. information. <laughs> This is such great information. My issue is not with, uh, I work at two colleges. The main issue is that a lot of people at the college have their heads, you know, in the sand. And I, I just, you know, am at my wits end getting, they won't even let the accessibility expert let, look at courses at one of the colleges. They, they won't actually allow any kind of assessment by an accessibility expert and they wanna be a poker school. So I'm so, I told them, I said, unless you're willing to let me help you by seeing the courses and, and doing it, I, I can't be part of this process. That was so upsetting for me because I really wanna help, but the I guess they have a union that says we don't have to do that. So what would you suggest Jest in that situation 
when you have such a powerful union that is saying they don't have to they don't have to allow anyone to check their courses for accessibility. It's just mind bog boggling to me. They're yeah. saying they're accessible, but I know without an expert helping them, they, they let's face it, maybe half are if they're right. Lucky. Yeah. So, so I, you, you make a really good point. So if they want to, if they want to become local poker certified, then that's a process that they will have, you know, that the college will have to adopt definitely. Uh, but meanwhile, you know, how do you deal with this, you know, um, uh, with that situation? It, it's really hard when it comes to union, but the bottom line is that we we do have to have our, our courses have to be accessible you know by if we we have to follow all of these different guidelines um you know um all you know um we we mentioned some of these uh throughout today's session um you know there's title five stuff there's um all of these other regulations that we have to follow and um to be honest in a situation like that if they're not um, if, if they're not, it, it sounds like they're saying that they're accessible, but they are not allowing for the accessibility expert to check the course for accessibility. Yeah, they're not allowing that and in any way, shape or form. And, yeah. the you know, one of the colleges I work at is outstanding. They Their accessibility um, compliance is, is wonderful. And I was hoping to extend that practice. Right. So I think that the the best that could be done for a situation like that is simply offer the resource, um, you know, because un until, you know, there is a change where, you know, kind of uh, what uh, Betsy presented, like, you know, academic Senate voted and, you know, this is instilled and this is the way the process is until something like that happens you know, th there's not very much that can be done besides offering the resources, offering the trainings, you know, offering the support. Um, you know, if anybody else has any other ideas, please drop them in the chat. Um, I'm sure, you know, everybody will be great. How are we going to enforce these Title II changes? I'm wondering for schools such as this. I you was wondering the same thing, Suzanne. I was yeah, wondering so like, on April 2027, yeah. like what's going to happen? You know, how how is this going to be monitored? That's that's something that, you know, I don't know how that's going to happen. But I am hoping that, you know, with, with these upcoming changes, it will kind of like make, you know, those areas aware and be like, wait, we, we should be paying attention to this because we are. Um, liable to these, you know, these changes that are coming with making, you know, things accessible. We've heard of all the, you know, of the colleges that have gotten in trouble for not having their content accessible, um, you know, and, and that's really unfortunate. And I know that all of us that are here, that's, you know, that, that's what we're trying. I mean, part of it is we're trying to avoid that, but we're also just designing for our students' needs, like we said, you know, that universal design um, always keeping that in mind. I'm going to go ahead and move on um, because we only have about Thank nine you. minutes and I want to get you all, I want to finish in time. Um, so um, closing out today's session, the big idea for today's session, we need to learn um, accessibility so well that it becomes part of our course design process. And I know that's something that we've kind of, you know, in poker, we've been trying to adopt like you know, when we design a course, accessibility should just be on our minds. And not only as reviewers do we have to do that, but also we need to instill that in our faculty. So just as um, both of the colleges that presented their process, they really try to, you know, have a lot of professional development in accessibility. And when they're when faculty is designing their courses, that that is always on their mind. And that's really hard to do because as I think, I don't know if it was, uh, which one of the presentations, there was a, a note that said uh, some instructors don't even know that we have Pope Tech um, or what that even is. And I think we can all resonate with that. Um, remember that it's nothing is 100% accessible. That is why we have that EEAAP, that plan that we have to develop. Um, uh, for those items that we know we cannot make accessible, as Suzanne mentioned, uh, we need to be proactive to be ready for students um, that need those alternate assignments. Uh, remember that the spirit of Title V is that the student 
uh, that needs accommodation should not have to wait or email us, uh, that accommodation should be ready for them. Um, and we need to grow processes around accessibility. Uh, and this is gonna look different in every single one of our colleges. But I think with uh, the information presented today and through other professional development opportunities across the state, I think that that's how every college builds their own you know, process and instills accessibility into that process. Um, okay, and finally, we do have a survey. Um, so Marilena is going to drop that link in the chat. If you can complete that survey, we really appreciate it. If you could give us feedback, uh, things that you want to see in future sessions, because these sessions will continue. I don't have dates yet, but that's um, I will have them soon. Um, so please complete uh, that survey for us. We'd really appreciate it. And then a few reminders. Um, let me see, what do I have? Oh, poker course registration. If, you have, if you're a poker lead and have any reviewers any people that want to become reviewers um, and you want them to get trained, email me. I'll send you those links out. Those went out with the email for this session. But if you've lost that email, no worries. I have them saved. Um, so email me and I'll get you those registration links. Uh, we do have two summer poker courses. Um, I don't have the dates off the top of my head, but I think July. But email me if you need those. Um, don't forget that poker course addendum to get a badge for section D that has to be completed by June 30th. After June 30th, that course will just turn public. Um, and then upcoming events. Oh, I was going to get more information on this and I didn't add it to the slide. I'm so sorry. We do have a CVC OERI webinar. I can tell you the date for that. And um, I didn't put the registration link anywhere on my radar, so I apologize. It is June, I don't wanna give you the wrong date. Let me see. Hmm. Maybe Brandon knows when it, our D -E, uh, O E R I C V C webinar is. Isn't it June 13th, I believe? I have, it gets, I have it's on my calendar, I have to, I have to look. I, I think believe June 13th I, sounds I right. Believe June, 13th, okay. June 13th. Uh, oh, yes, yes, June 13th at 3 p.m. Yeah, and uh, I the registration link, I don't have it on me. Oh, but Valerie does. Valerie did. Thank you, Valerie. There it is, the registration link. Thank you, team, for, for coming through. Um, there it is. And the focus of that CBC OERI webinar is going to be on. Um, uh, adding OERs into our Canvas courses and making sure that that is accessible and that it, well, that it follows, I take it back, that it follows um, our CVC course design rubric. So making sure that it's aligned. So anyway, um, and then if you are going to OTC uh, this June, I will be there. Um, Marilena will be there. The whole CVC team will be there. So please if you see us walking by, if you see me walking by, please stop me and say hi. I'd be so happy to meet you face to face if you're gonna be there. Um, and that I think is my last slide, except to say thank you everybody for attending. Um, thank you to the presenters. You guys all did a wonderful job. I really hope that this session was helpful to you. And remember it is recorded, so it will be available on our poker site. And if you have any questions, feel free to email me. Thank you, everyone, so very much. Four minutes to spare. Yes. So, Chair, I also put the dates for the poker sessions for summer in the chat as well. Well, there's one that starts on July 8th and then one that starts on the week after on July 15th. Thank you so much for doing that.